All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today's community outreach presentation on understanding and managing high blood pressure, sponsored by CPMC's Canbar Cardiac Care Center. Today, we're fortunate to have consultative and interventional cardiologist Dr. Benjamin Romick here with us to discuss the prevalence, risk factors, symptoms, diagnostic testing, and management strategies for hypertension. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few words about the Canbar Cardiac Care Center. It was originally founded in 2002 at the CPMC Pacific Heights campus and relaunched at the CPMC Van Ness campus in 2022. The center was formed through the generous contributions of the late Maurice Canbar, who was an inventor, innovator, entrepreneur, but more importantly, a philanthropist. The Canbar Cardiac Care Center is one of the highest ranking cardiac health facilities in California and offers an array of cardiac health services and specialists who use advanced technologies to diagnose and treat patients with heart disease. Uh, its na nationally recognized uh, physicians, surgeons, and clinicians are committed to providing excellent personalized care in a contemporary and welcoming setting. And with that, I'll go ahead and pass it along to Dr. Romick to introduce himself and dive into the presentation. Uh, thank you, Lily. Um, that's a, a great introduction, and um, it's uh, my pleasure to uh, to be invited to talk about um, this important subject today on uh, um, the CANBAR Community Education Program for uh, with high blood pressure, um, otherwise uh, known as hypertension in the in the medical community. It's uh, it's a very important issue that I think um, uh, mandates uh, you know growing awareness because it's uh, such it really is a a public health um, issue of, of uh, great proportions. Um, <clears throat> as I'll point out in one of my later slides, it's, uh, it's been a recent call to action by the, um, uh, the Surgeon General uh, for the U.S., um, which um, has only been done three times in the last uh, 10 years or so. So it is uh, definitely an important um, public health issue. Um, and it's my pleasure to talk to you a little bit about uh, the importance of that today. <clears throat> um, as Lily stated, I'm a, a cardiologist, an interventional cardiologist. Uh, I practice here um, at uh, California Pacific Medical Center, um, as well as with uh, my group, which is a Sutter West Bay Medical Group um, with offices here in San Francisco. And uh, hypertension has become a kind of a focus um, and interest of mine uh, because of, I think, the need for, for further awareness and, uh, and better treatment um, on a public health level. So with that, I'll uh, jump into the first slide. <clears throat> there we go. Sorry. So this is, uh, this is an infographic um, that actually kind of summarizes everything that I'm going to talk about in this, uh, in this talk. So if there's one slide that you're going to pay attention to for this presentation, this is it. So, but I'm going to delve more into to some of these different topics. But, um, but high blood pressure, you know, I think uh, just getting the facts and getting it checked is is uh, is a big uh, importance. Um, so, um, what is it? It's uh, essentially um, uh, measures how strongly uh, the pressure inside your vascular system um, and your arteries is. And essentially, the reason it's important is because uh, hypertension over time can basically create additional strain um, on your organs, various organs, and your and your vascular and cardiovascular system. Um, as you can see here. Uh, we, the, um, the different definitions of hypertension, and these have changed over the years as different guidelines and consensus and data have come along, but this is based on the most recent uh, guideline from the American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology that was published in um, 2017, uh, which defines hypertension now most currently as kind of repeated blood pressure of greater than 130 over 80. And that's for either or both numbers, so the systolic being 130 and the diastolic being uh, 80. Um, in the past, it, it has been a little bit more 
lenient, I guess, if you could say, based on joint national committee giant, uh, guidelines, of, of which there were eight renditions that went up through 2014. Uh, but the American Heart Association has kind of taken oh, taken on, um, you know, I guess the duty now of kind of defining uh, guidelines and consensus about uh, hypertension at this point. And then, you know, there's different stages of hypertension as well. I'd also like to point out that um, actually normal truly normal blood pressure is actually considered as 120 over 80, but you meet the diagnosis of hypertension when it's above 130 over 80. And if you have hypertension, that's the treatment goal, is to try and get to or lower than 130 over 80. Um, as you can see, it's a very common um, issue. In the U.S., approximately 50% of the adult U.S. population, it's estimated, uh, has hypertension. And we have a lot of work to do on control. So seven, it's estimated that, um, I believe this data goes up through 2022, it's estimated that 76% of those with hypertension are uncontrolled by these definitions. Uh, so, in, or the converse is that only about a quarter of patients who have hypertension actually have it under what is considered adequate control. So it is um, obviously a big issue that needs to be uh, addressed um, on a public health level. Um, and then even, sorry, I apologize, this clicker. Um, and then even beyond that, even it's estimated that um, only uh, up to a third of patients that have hypertension are not even aware that they have it as well. So obviously those patients are not being treated as well. Um, there are um, kind of social and racial um, uh, discrepancies in terms of how well it's managed and, and who and higher rates of it. So in the um, African-American population, for instance, um, have five times the mortality um, uh, with hypertension. And we'll go into that a little bit more too. And then, um, you know, hypertension is not an all or nothing phenomenon. So, so just even if you don't get to goal treatment, you can still have fairly significant uh, reductions in risk for various adverse events, uh, even with small uh, degrees of improvement in blood pressure. Um, there's a lot that patients can do um, in terms of diet, uh, moderating alcohol intake, increasing activity, losing weight, um, as well as lowering salt intake. So I get a lot of questions in my practice from patients about, well, if I don't want to take medication, is there anything else I can do? Well, these, there's, there, so the answer is yes, there is a, a lot that patients can do. It often isn't necessarily a this or that, it's, it's rather the whole the whole package or both medicine and uh, healthy lifestyle. Um, but there definitely are things that patients can do to help uh, both avoid blood pressure uh, or developing hypertension or helping to treat it and improve your outcomes if you do have hypertension. Um, and then finally, the cost of hypertension to our society is huge, partly because it's so common, uh, but also because uh, it's inadequately treated, um, leading to these other kind of downstream effects. So, um, so it's, it's estimated that those who have hypertension actually, uh, they spend their their expenditures are three times greater um, on healthcare costs than those that don't have hypertension. So um, again, kind of getting into the the uh, nuts and bolts about you know what constitutes hypertension and what the definitions are. So again, this is from the ACC AHA 2017 hypertension guidelines, and that's the most recent U.S. guidelines that we have on this. And as you can see in the red, these are the various stages of hypertension. Um, and then there, there, there can be a distinguishment about what we term primary hypertension, or it used to be termed essential hypertension, which applies to most uh, patients with hypertension, about actually about 90 to 95% of patients who have uh, hypertension are considered to have 
what, the, what is deemed primary hypertension. And that means there's no specific secondary cause to it. It's just a multifactorial um, issue. And, and these are some of the contributors to primary hypertension. So um, obesity is a big one. Um, we know that obesity rates have been on the rise in our country over the last at least two decades. Um, I distinctly remember when I was a internal medicine intern way back in 2001, um, sitting in lecture, seeing kind of the map of the U.S. Uh, with where there was rates of 30% or higher obesity rates. And back then it was like two states. Uh, I think it was either Mississippi and Alabama or Mississippi and Louisiana, and I happened to be doing part of my residency in Mississippi at the time. Um, and now, like more recent maps have shown a much kind of broader um, part of the U.S. in terms of states that, that uh, kind of have an epidemic of obesity. And so with obesity has come higher rates of hypertension and probably speaking to some of the more difficulties in achieving adequate control as well as our population has become more obese. So, so that's kind of my outlook on, you know, it makes sense that why the two would go hand in hand. Um, insulin resistance or... Um, which is a kind of a component of diabetes, can also lead, um, uh, contribute to hypertension. Elevated alcohol intake, hence one of the recommendations for lifestyle um, modifications to not, not to, not to consume moderate alcohol intake, but to moderate intake. So in other words, when we say two drinks a day for men, as moderate intake or moderating your intake or one drink a day for women. It doesn't mean you should do that. It just means you should moderate your alcohol intake to ideally no more than that on average. Um, high salt intake is a contributor. Um, it doesn't necessarily on an individual level always contribute. Uh, there is this phenomenon that's called salt sensitivity um, and some patients have it, some don't. It's actually kind of an entity that's a little bit difficult to evaluate and prove, but we do know that on a societal level, a higher salt intake definitely contributes to higher rates of hypertension as well as the uh, higher rates of the adverse outcomes that come with that. The one most striking example is in Asian populations, much higher salt intake as part of their kind of culture and diet. Well, they have higher rates of hypertension and higher rates of stroke as well. So it's not, and it's hard to prove a direct causal, causational relationship, but we do know that the two are related and we do know that those associations exist. Um, aging process, unfortunately, also just, you were kind of, all of us are fighting a, an uphill battle with aging. Um, doesn't mean you throw in the towel, but just to recognize that that is a contributing factor as well. I do get a lot of uh, questions about that in my practice too. Well, why does it get, can it get worse over time? The answer, the way I think of it as aging is probably a couple, a few different things. Um, one is, you know, as we age our, um, our arterial and vascular system stiffens, you lose some of the fibroelasticity of it. And so with that, it's, it's kind of a less compliant vascular system and that can lead to changes in blood pressure. Um, number two is um, the kidneys play a huge regulatory role in, uh, high, in the blood pressure as well. Um, there's intrinsic feedback mechanisms uh, through hormonal axes and so forth. And um, there is kind of a natural slight kind of age-related degradation in kidney function as we age. And so with that, um, kind of higher levels of, of um, blood pressure. And then lastly, there's probably, you know, as we age, there's changes in metabolism and how we metabolize medications, for example. And so, you know, with your antihypertensive medications, for example, you may require more medication over time to keep an adequate blood pressure control because you may not metabolize those quite the same over time. Um, sedentary lifestyle, so, so that's a, a definite contributor. You know, in our society, there's definitely a trend towards, um, 
you know, more sedentary lifestyle as we become a busier population um, and, and so on. Um, and we know that exercise can help to lower it as well. And then low potassium intake and low calcium intake as well. So, uh, and those are through hormonal changes with both the kidneys and the adrenal glands that can kind of have feedback mechanisms and lead to uh, kind of greater um, there's this angiotensin um, slash aldosterone recept uh, um, a hormonal access, and that uh, through that mechanism, uh, you can get higher rates of, of uh, blood pressure or hypertension um, it, with lower potassium and lower calcium intake. And the vice versa is true. So by having adequate potassium intake, in, it could actually help control your blood pressure better. So um, why do we care about hypertension? Well, this slide, I think, says a lot of it. So hypertension, uh, to be blunt about it, uh, leads to end organ damage and even potential death over time. And so, as in some of my slides, I'll show, you know, as far as a root cause, hypertension is considered to be the, the biggest cause of death. Now, not specifically so, so we know that cardiovascular disease in the U.S. is the biggest direct cause of death, but hypertension is an underlying huge contributor to uh, cardiovascular disease, um, whether it be um, ventricular tachy different arrhythmias that can be uh, life-threatening or uh, lethal uh, through such things as the uh, ventricular hypertrophy and changes in the heart that hypertension can cause over time, leading to scar formation in uh, the ventricles of the heart that can um, contribute or increase the risk of these arrhythmias. We know that hypertension is a big risk factor to developing congestive heart failure, which is also um, on the rise and um, becoming more and more common in our country. And then also cardiovascular or ischemic heart disease with heart attacks or myocardial infarction. Um, hypertension can also lead to kidney disease and even end-stage renal disease with dialysis. Um, and we all, and many are aware that it's also a major contributor to risk of stroke and not just ischemic stroke, but also hemorrhagic strokes as well. Um, and then one thing they don't include on here that I'll often talk to my patients about too is, is um, eye disease or ocular disease. So hypertension over time can lead to thickening in the, um, the retinal arteries. Sometimes we see that on exam known as AV nicking. Um, and it can even lead to retinal hemorrhages and so forth that can um, impair eyesight over time also. So um, again, it's the leading kind of underlying cause of death in the U.S. and worldwide. Um, it was the primary or contributing cause of death in 2018 for nearly half a million people in the U.S., which translates to about, a thir about an estimated 1,300 people a day that hypertension contributes to their ultimate um, death. Um, it dramatically, as we stated, increases the risk of heart attacks, strokes, heart failure, and kidney failure. Um, and it can also uh, contribute to cognitive decline as well. Some of that's probably through the mechanism of strokes. So we know that multiple strokes can also lead to cognitive decline, but there are other independent factors as well. And as you can see here, um, it, uh, it uh, hypertension essentially trumps tobacco as well as dietary risks, air pollution, in terms of the underlying cause of death. Um, and then when you look at patients who have uncontrolled hypertension with uh, causes of death systolic, attributed systolic blood pressure greater than 140, so ischemic heart disease tops that. So these this would be basically a million or three and a half million, because this is in thousands. But as you can see here, it also leads to increased rates of ischemic stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, other cardiovascular disease like heart failure, like we were talking about, and other arrhythmias, as well as chronic kidney disease. So, as I mentioned, um, it's not an all or nothing phenomenon. So, yes, we want to. Our goal 
in treating patients with hypertension is to get to a target at least of 130 over 80 or lower. But if you, there's various reasons, obviously, with because we have such poor control rates overall in this country, there's a lot of various reasons why we don't ultimately get to that target. But that doesn't mean we can't have success in helping patients in terms of improving their uh, risk of these adverse events by treating blood pressure, just by raising, uh, lowering it a little bit. So as you can see here, uh, just by lowering it on average by five points, um, you, can, you can accrue a 10% relative risk reduction in a major cardiovascular disease, a 13% uh, car, uh, relative risk reduction in stroke, 14% in heart failure, 7% in ischemic heart disease, and 5% in cardiovascular death. And then for if you have 10, uh, a lowering of another five or a total of 10 on average points of lowering it, it, it at least doubles the, the risk reduction for each of those categories. So again, just an incremental reduction uh, can go a long way in terms of improving outcomes, even if you don't ultimately reach the target of 130 over 80. So again, um, nearly one out of two adults in the United States has, uh, has hypertension, um, and that translates into about uh, 116 million people that are diagnosed. So this is as of uh, 2022, this is based on data from the what's called the Million Hearts Program. So this is, there are a couple of um, na nationwide um, campaigns to, to try to create metrics and, you know, enroll in quality programs um, uh, that hospitals and clinics can participate in. And the Million Hearts is one of them, and there's another one called Target BP. And so they kind of accrue some of this data, and so that's where this has come from. Um, and then, again, kind of consistent with that rate of nearly two-thirds that are uncontrolled, about 92 million uh, out of those 116 million um, are not controlled. And then about 34 million of those, it's estimated from this data set, are uh, not even treated for their hypertension. So. This, the, the, the takeaway from this is that I take is we as a society and as a medical system have a lot of work to do uh, to try and improve these numbers, especially in kind of a well-developed um, westernized society that we are that, that with a lot of healthcare expenditures. So, um, the issue is growing as well, and the control of blood pressure has actually been declining over the last few years, at least up through 2018, as I'll show in a minute here. Uh, so despite the large amount of national attention, um, uh, again, as we've stated, it's a huge problem and it's growing. Um, the, and uh, because uh, control rates have continued to drop, this puts patients at risk. So. Again, I've uh, kind of driven home that number that 76% or about uh, three-fourths three of patients do not have their blood pressure under attic and control under current definitions. Um, and a lot of that is because of non-adherence to, ther to therapy. So it's estimated that up to 50% of patients uh, um, are not taking their prescribed medications, at least on a regular basis. Um, and then also during the COVID um, era, which fortunately um, it's more of an endemic now, we're kind of coming to uh, an end of the worst of it, but during the COVID era, if you had hypertension, you were two times as likely uh, in terms of your mortality from COVID compared to somebody that does not have hypertension. So, so it manifests its importance in many different ways. Um, and that's a striking figure with the, with the COVID epidemic. So again, um, as we mentioned, lifestyle changes in medicine are effective, but patients still uh, remain uncontrolled. 
Um, and again, that, that statistic that 50% of patients become non-adherent to antihypertensive therapy within one year of initiating therapy as well. And here's uh, the slide I alluded to kind of demonstrating that um, at least up through 2018, um, uh, blood pressure control rates have been on the decline um, with a 10% decline in blood pressure control rates over the five years between 2013 and 2018. Uh, moving, kind of changing gears to, um, you know, in terms of statistics overview, uh, overview as I mentioned, uh, different populations have uh, different vulnerabilities and different control rates. So, so this clearly shows here that, um, you know, in the uh, African American population, which is the dark blue here, they have the highest rates of. Um, hypertension in the U.S. out of these four different groups, which include um, African Americans, um, Asian adults, um, um, Hispanic adults, and then Caucasians or non-Hispanic white adults. Um, and then, although uh, Caucasians have the second highest rates, followed by Asians and then uh, Hispanics. But then when you look at the control rates, actually, Asian populations have the lowest control rates. Um, and again, some speculate because of higher salt intake, uh, that may be partly the cause. Uh, but then African Americans have the, the second lowest um, uh, rates of control. And then as far as the cost, so the annual health care costs increase greatly um, as you um, have hypertension. So, so we, again, a lot of light has been shined over the years about, you know, the gross expended health care costs in our country and how they differ uh, much more uh, compared to other similar um, developed countries. Um, so the annual costs of treating hypertension are expected to triple the $200 billion uh, um, in the U.S. alone bit in the two decades from 2010 to 2030, and we're actually getting close to 2030 already. Um, adults with hypertension also accounted for 41% of all U.S. health care spending in 2016, um, with over half of that coming in the, the um, higher age group of 50, uh, adults age 55 to 64. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, adults who have hypertension um, have a, 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 a three, an over threefold higher um, expenditure on Medicare, medical care as compared to those who don't have hypertension. There's another statistic as well that um, within that, um, those that have hypertension, their out-of-pocket costs for their health care are also double those that um, that don't have hypertension. So basically, if you're a patient with hypertension, not only does it does it you know, your medical costs for the healthcare system as a whole greater, but also what you are paying individually as a patient is more than double that if you don't have hypertension. So it is important both on an individual level as well as a society level and our overall healthcare system. Um, and their costs for hypertension patients for healthcare are growing faster as well, um, with uh, an 18% increase over this time versus 14% increase in costs in patient in adults who do not have hypertension. Um, so as you can see here, just by different age groups in this uh, graph here, uh, those who have hypertension in the yellow are in yellow, and those who don't have hypertension are in blue. And you can see the, the much different dramatic um, rates of costs here at, at all different age groups. So um, we're actually coming to the end, so we'll have uh, plenty of time for questions. Um, but just a slide in terms of, again, a lot of patients ask, hypertension, what can you do as a patient? Well, I think it starts with just awareness. So 
talks like this. So I commend all of you for taking the time out to, um, to attend this talk, both virtually or in person, to learn more about it and um, what the impacts of hypertension are and why it's important. Um, and then being aware of kind of the numbers and what they are and when you should be concerned and to, to kind of have a discussion with your doctor about it. Um, so getting checked for hypertension. So there's numerous ways to get checked, not even just in the office seeing your, your, um, your doctor. Certainly kind of by default, we check the blood pressure almost all the time, but there can be a lot of limitations to the office blood pressure measurement. A lot of patients do have what's termed white coat hypertension, so their blood pressure may be more elevated in the office as compared to at home. Um, or uh, even, even if it's not true white coat hypertension, um, we do see that as a trend, and that has been borne out in multiple studies where when you compare certain populations with their office blood pressure measurement versus home blood pressure measurements, there tends to be an average of a five to 10 point higher rate in the office versus at home. Um, so kind of getting, uh, you know, if you're interested in kind of growing awareness of hypertension, get a home blood pressure monitor so that you can start monitoring it at home. It's actually very easy. One of my next slides has an example of uh, blood pressure monitors and their different costs just by a simple Google, Google search. Um, these uh, are modern blood pressure monitor uh, kits. They often will have a memory function that saves so many of your last blood pressure readings, some of them up to 50, 60 readings or so. Um, and um, and then lifestyle modifications, as we've kind of a, uh, really alluded to. So lots of fruits and veggies, low flat, low fat, uh, plant-based diet as well. Uh, probably not only just for hypertension, but um, there are a lot of emerging benefits of a plant-based diet, both in terms of reducing cardiovascular disease. Um, improving bone density, for example, important um, as especially in women um, with aging, but also in men too. Um, and decreased cancer risks as well. We know that red meat and processed meats have a profoundly higher risk with uh, particularly GI cancers, and, and we see lower rates of that um, with a plant-based diet. Um, plant, that being said, it's difficult, I get it, you know, and kind of that's a cultural issue in our society as well. Um, and it can be hard to make that change. Um, but there are a lot of resources and educational um, uh, resources like this as well um, out in the community that can kind of help with that. Um, and decreasing your salt intake. So kind of the dogma has been try to limit it to two to three grams per day. That is difficult. Um, but again, I don't look at it as an all or nothing phenomenon. So just by lowering your salt intake, you're probably going to, you, you may be more likely to help with your blood pressure or alternatively avoid getting blood pressure hypertension in the first place. Um, moderating alcohol intake. So again, not that you should drink a moderate level of alcohol, but you should moderate your alcohol intake to two drinks a day or less if you're a male or one drink per day or less if you're a female. And then exercise, getting 90 to 150 minutes of exercise uh, weekly is what's recommended. Um, but any exercise is good. Um, there's also been studies that just show walking, regular walking may confer similar cardiovascular benefit to more higher intensity levels of exercise too. So, so I wouldn't get fixated on, oh, does it have to be moderate level or higher intensity exercise? Any exercise and regular exercise is good. Just kind of avoiding that sedentary lifestyle. And then weight loss. Weight loss can also go a big way. You can get an average of five points uh, down with, uh, with uh, just weight loss and even greater degrees of weight loss depending where you're starting with as well. And again, that ties weight, obesity, 
uh, ties into a lot of other things that is this this big cycle that is interrelated with uh, with hypertension uh, greater re- greater rates of sleep apnea for example we know that's a big driver of a secondary cause um, of hypertension um, those uh, you know more obesity probably um, uh, more adverse dietary practices as well that may directly lead to uh, greater rates of hypertension. Insulin resistance we know is higher in the obese population as well. So, so not only by not only does it help with reducing your rates, your risk of hypertension, and potentially improving your blood pressure control with weight loss, but also may help with some of these, many of these other things like reducing your rates of sleep apnea, reducing your um, insulin resistance, uh, reducing your lipids as well, um, making it easier and more fulfilling to, to participate in exercise and make it a regular habit, for example. And then, like as I mentioned, um, having a high, this is more on the clinician side, but also as patients, um, having just a greater awareness of sleep apnea, what some of the signs and symptoms are, and, um, and how it can be diagnosed and when to, to have a suspicion for it. Um, I can actually tell you I'm a, I'm a sleep apnea patient, and I recently uh, started CPAP treatment in the last month, and it has made a huge difference in terms of my um, energy levels and so forth. Probably why I'm so wide awake today rather than um, half asleep or what have you. So, um, But anyway, sleep, just recognize, be aware that sleep apnea can be a common underlying factor, particularly for patients who have resistant hypertension. So as I mentioned, this is an example. So, so the most common and probably well-known blood pressure monitor is the the Omron. They have actually a bunch of different models. There's like the Series 3, the Series 5, the Series 7, the Series 11, and all of them have different features depending on what you want and how much you want to spend. But as you can see here, you can get a you can get a monitor for 18 bucks off of Amazon, so it doesn't have to break the bank. I would say, on average, that it's going to cost 30 to 50 dollars. Um, there are even some resources through, like the pharmacy and so forth program. I know that where patients can even get a complimentary or funded through a grant um, for a uh, home blood pressure monitor as well. Um, but again, the point being is just a simple Google search for um, Omron blood pressure monitor produces a wealth of different um, uh, options at various prices where you don't even have to leave your house. You just click the button and order on Amazon and it shows up in your house in 12 to 48 hours. So, And then as I kind of in closing, just as I touched on, um, the Surgeon General's office um, has a call to action on hypertension. Again, as I've laid out, because it is such a big public health issue. Um, so, and they're, uh, with the CDC's uh, help, they're uh, focusing on kind of three different categories. Uh, so, prioritizing blood pressure control nationally. So, that's through increasing the awareness. Um, of, of what hypertension is, what the definition is, and the health, health risks. So that's what we're doing today is we're educating and we're increasing the awareness. Um, we're rec- and to recognize the economic burden, so we've gone over that today, and then uh, trying to address disparities among different populations as we've laid out as well. Um, and then cultivating community support, so by promoting different physical activities, so kind of helping to get patients and, and motivate patients to get out or, or people to get out and um, exercise more and improve exercise, promoting healthy food opportunities, and then um, um, connecting to different resources that can educate on uh, healthy lifestyle um, and those resources. And then finally, with the healthcare system, uh, really just optimizing patient care. So using standardized treatment approaches um, and then promoting a team-based care. So um, 
one of the things that's kind of growing and there's a, a growing kind of encouragement and something we're looking at and working on here is a hypertension program. So kind of a more organized resourced program to really try to provide more resources and regular follow-ups and care to try and, and education for patients to really try to to try and move the needle to get better blood pressure control and also diagnose uh, hypertension at an earlier stage as well in those that have it. Um, empowering and equipping patients, so through education as well as kind of giving them the tools to monitor it, you know, encouraging them to obtain their own blood pressure monitors so that they can monitor it at home. And then also recognizing and rewarding clinicians and programs that are uh, really working towards this and doing a good job in treating their patient populations. So as I've mentioned, there's a couple different programs, a couple different quality programs nationally, the Million Hearts program and the Target BP program that have kind of different recogni recognition levels based on um, the kind of the rates of control that you're achieving. Um, so, and as I mentioned, this is a big deal. Um, you know, because uh, this is this is just this is one of only three um, uh, calls to action that the Surgeon General's Office has made over the last three years, included with skin, uh, skin cancer call to action in 2014 and breastfeeding um, in 2011. Um, and their goal, as they set out for this at first, was to improve hypertension control rates to 80% by 2025. Well, it's 2024, so I don't, that's a lofty goal, um, but it doesn't mean we stop. Um, we've still got a lot of work to do, and we still should continue to work towards better uh, blood pressure control um, and treatment um, in our society. And I believe with that, um, that's about my last slide. Yep, so we're gonna switch gears now to question and answer it. Thank you, thank you everybody. Yeah, thank you Dr. Romick, that was great. So actually I have a couple questions. Yeah. Um, do you recommend the time of the day the patient can switch check the, the blood pressure? Um, yeah, so, you know, it's interesting because a lot of the literature that I've looked at recommends checking it, checking it three times when you check it uh, and then at the same time each day. Um, and there is, there is, I think the three times is, is definitely a good thing. And then you just average, you know, the three readings and kind of jot that down. Um, you know, I think there, I actually, in, encourage patients to check it at different times um, of the day. So, because we do know that it can waver at different times of the day, you know, in terms of patterns. We know that it's a little bit lower at night or it should be lower at night. Um, we see this when we do, there's a, there's a test called an ambulatory blood pressure monitor, which is, um, it's called a 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor. And we administer that with our clinic as well. And that's, that's really the gold standard actually for mon assessing and determining whether there's, well, first of all, if there's hypertension, but also whether it's under con adequate control, uh, but it can also look at the trends too. So, so if you're checking at the same time every day, you might, and, and it's lower, it actually tends to be higher in the morning. Um, you might, but then, as you, if you're not checking in in the afternoon, you may just always get a higher reading than if you were checking it at different times or vice versa. You might get, if you're checking it always in the evening or in the afternoon, you might get a false sense that it's a, it's just fine when maybe it's actually quite elevated in the morning sometimes. So for that reason, not to, but then everybody's got complicated lives as well. So I think that may be part of the recommendation to, to do it at the same time, just so that you can get in a, kind of a routine. And that's still okay. It's better than not checking it at all. But I feel that it's probably best to check it, try to check it if you're going to do it at different times of the day when you, it doesn't mean you have to check it every day in the morning, 
at noon and then in the afternoon and at night. But, you know, say on Mondays, on on one day you check it in the morning, another day you may check it, try to check it in the afternoon and what have you, just to get a different sampling. Um, my second question is like, uh, um, how do you, like, what do we or do patient do when they check a blood pressure and it says 135 over 92, and then they check it again in two minutes, uh, and there's, there's 126 over 85. Yeah, so that's that's the idea behind kind of when you check it, check it once, check it again in five minutes or so, and then check it again in another five minutes, and then just kind of average them. Because, yes, there is this phenomenon where you might check the first one and it's high and then you kind of settle down a little bit and then it's it's lower on the subsequent ones so just average them. yeah so it's recommended to average the three thank you mm -hmm. um so i have a couple questions too yes. um the first one is um uh from what you know uh in terms of development of hypertension um, how much is due to environmental risk factors versus uh, genetic predisposition? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's, it's difficult to say. I, I mean, I don't have any specific kind of uh, percentages or statistics on it, but I think it's I think it's 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 obviously multifactorial as we've kind of elucidated. You know, whether it's obesity and uh, insulin resistance. Um, and environmental factors, diet. So, so um, all of those things have multiple factors that contribute. So I think it's both. Um, essentially, it's a combination of both and just depending on the individual patient. Um, we cert I certainly see patients who, yeah, their, their grandmother and their grandparents had hypertension, their parents had hypertension, they have hypertension sometimes at an early age and it follows this pattern and there probably is a genetic component to that. Um, in practice, it's hard to tease that out like as far as a specific gene because again, it's so complex. There's so many different things that contribute to hypertension. Um, and then, yeah, there's obviously environmental factors. I mean, if you're, if you're overweight and you eat a lot of salt and you're eating fast food all the time and you're very sedentary and you have diabetes and you have sleep apnea and you don't get enough potassium, you're, I mean, you're, that's a, like a poster child for developing hypertension. And a lot of those are societal or environmental factors. Okay. Thank you. Um, and my other question is, um, you mentioned um, kind of the adherence has been on a decline over the last several years. Um, what are some factors for it or some possible reasons? Yeah. So I looked at this a little bit in some of those papers that, that reported this. And, you know, it sounds like they, like from an expert standpoint, it's, it's not for sure known. Um, there, there are definitely some hypotheses or kind of, um, I guess, notions that, um, for lack of a better term, educated guesses as well. Um, partly, uh, some of it just may do be due to, um, you know, all these other health problems inside, kind of losing focus on it, for example. Um, so that's one of the big things. Another thing is kind of the kind of the way like our culture and kind of society you know just going towards more higher stress at work kind of you know uh, greater disparities in uh, different patient populations and income and being able to even afford health care or uh, medications as well um, there's other specific things you know like my in my patient population this is it's kind of taming down a little bit but you know, a few years ago, there was this whole uh, kind of scandal about generic, different generic hypertensive medications, actually generics in general, and having different additives that may be harmful. And, and some of my patients have had a lot of angst about that, you know, and kind of trying to talk them off a cliff and say, well, look, yeah, there might be some, but, you know, look at the hazard by not treating your blood pressure that we know is there. So, so some of that's just education too, and, and kind of working with patients to find a, a suitable regimen as well. And 
you know, admittedly, as clinicians, we don't always have all the time to, to devote to like working through, you know, okay, what's what's a workable regimen um, and so forth. And it really does take a lot of work and repeated follow-ups um, for some patients, uh, you know, those that have different um, kind of intolerances to medications and so on. So, so I think it's a combination of those factors. Um, there's some speculation about, well, whether it's just that we've moved the goalposts, right? So like the JNC-8, for example, that was published in 2014, their treatment goal was 140 over 90. Well, if you make the treatment goal lower, then by definition, you're going to have more people that fall into an un uncontrolled category. However, if you saw, you, you can't necessarily use that, the 2017 goals to explain the decline in control that was occurring before up leading up to that from 2013 to 2018 as well. So, so it's not just that we've moved the goalposts over time to make a higher number of patients fall into a category of being un uncontrolled by making the target lower, but it's also these other fact, probably these other factors too. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. Thank you. Dr. Okay. Yep. Um, what is the what is the relation with the sleep apnea? Why does that contribute to the high blood pressure? Yeah, so um, I mean, one of the most prominent things is it. Um, you know, when you interrupt your sleep cycles um, and, and you don't get adequate sleep, um, it it raises these stress hormones. For example, so you know, if you if you go back to Kind of primitive man, so to speak, and they're they're you know they're on the run, you know, and they're not. I mean, it 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 raises those stress hormones, and that had a purpose back then. But if you're chronically sleep deprived, even if you're kind of sleeping, quote unquote, but you never get into that deep sleep, then it can raise your your stress hormones, cortisol levels, and so forth. And we know that that contributes to um, greater levels of hypertension as well. Thank you. For stage one hypertension, if we can't get it under control with um, exercise and diet, do you recommend um, starting on medications? Um, yeah, so it's, it's patient specific, you know, um, so this is a conversation I have with, uh, with my patients. Um, and again, um, I don't look at it as either or it's kind of both things. Um, I mean, if a patient's sitting at, you know, their blood pressure is at 139 over 82 and they're motivated, you know, to start exercising and losing weight, uh, if it's if applicable, or changing their diet, and they really oppose taking medication. I mean, I'm not going to force the issue on them. I mean, anything you can do is beneficial. I mean, I will say that if you if you are willing to take medication in those situations, um, it's probably the most direct route to getting better control. Um, and it doesn't even necessarily mean you have to stay on medication permanently. I do occasionally have patients that come off of their blood pressure medications. It's not, it's not frequent, but occasionally we do. I, you know, I see patients, uh, you know, lose weight and suddenly their blood pressure is much better. Um, you know, so, so it's, it's, a, it's an individual conversation. Great, thank you for answering those questions, Dr. Mm -hmm. Romick. I have a few in the chat, and um, this one kind of goes along with the last yeah. one. Um, this person self-monitors their mm -hmm. blood pressure. For the most part, it falls within normal limits, but on occasion, it's elevated. What constitutes getting on medication? Yeah, so, um, yeah, also understand that um, everybody's blood pressure is going to fluctuate periodically. So, so nobody, I mean, even as we see, you can check it once and then you check it again in five minutes and it may be different, maybe even dramatically different. So 
you know, while you don't want to have your blood pressure frequently, you know, pegged at 180 over 110 or, you know, in a really dangerous range, um, you know, I try to focus not as much on just the, the kind of the swings or, but kind of keeping it more of an even keel and what the averages would be. So in somebody that say their blood pressure is mostly controlled at a good level, but occasionally it's elevated in the elevated range. Um, you know, again, it goes back to how, how aggressively do we want to get at it? So that may not necessarily need to be treated at all. Um, if you're just recognizing that, yeah, occasionally it might be slightly elevated, but most of the readings are good. Um, and especially if they're, they're wanting to make some lifestyle, um, adjustments. So medication may not be necessarily the right choice for that patient. Um, so that's what I would say about that. Great. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Romick. Um, next, I have a question about chronic kidney disease. Do you mm -hmm. have any specific recommendations for managing blood pressure for CKD patients specifically? Yeah, so there, there are some of the medications that you have to use greater caution with in uh, kidney patients. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're contraindicated or can't be used, but the risk level is a little bit higher. So um, kind of three of the classes that I, I would kind of allude to would be um, diuretics. So, um, you know, the class of diuretics, so included with those would be medicines like hydrochlorothiazide, um, furosemide, which is a, a stronger diuretic, um, um, or, or there's a longer acting one called chlorthalidone. So, so you do need to monitor that. You, you, well, you have to monitor it in everybody, but you need to monitor even closer in uh, patients who have kidney disease and especially the potassium levels. Um, and then there's ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. Um, those you also have to be cautious about in chronic kidney disease patients, but it's kind of like a double-edged sword. While you have to be cautious, those specific medications actually have particular benefit uh, for treating hypertension in chronic kidney disease patients where they've shown particular benefits in reducing some of the adverse outcomes, particularly in, in kidney patients. So, so with those in particular, while we have to be more cautious, they, depending on the level of the kidney disease, they can be a preferred medication for those patients. And then the last class would be, um, um, what are called mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists. Um, so there's two in particular. One is called spironolactone and the other is called um, a plerinone. And you actually, you do have to be, again, it's not that they're in kidney, chronic kidney disease patients who have maybe mild to moderate kidney dysfunction. It's not that they're contraindicated, but you just have to be more cautious and closer monitoring of labs. For example, getting high potassium levels can be a particular danger with those drugs in kidney patients. Um, and at a certain level, those drugs also become contraindicated if the kidney dysfunction is severe. There are other um, classes that are really kind of neutral or relatively safe. Uh, beta blockers, for example, are fairly safe in kidney patients, although they're not as in general, beta blockers may not be as effective. They're kind of considered more third or actually fourth or even fifth line agents. Um, calcium channel blockers are generally pretty safe in kidney patients as well. Great. Thank you, Dr. Romick. Yeah. Um, we just have one last question here. Um, can you talk more about how, and you did talk about this, but maybe if you could elaborate on how to strengthen the health of vessels and arteries as we age without medication? Yeah, so I think um, exercise is probably the most direct um, factor there. You know, with greater exercise, you, you know, you have better compliance of the vascular system, uh, better cardiac output and blood flow, particularly to your muscular system. Um, 
So, so that's, I would say directly, that's one of the factors. Um, you know, it, it's almost this cycle where, you know, as we stated, the, the greater your blood pressure over time, it, it leads to more wear and tear and greater stress on the cardiovascular system and, and probably more hardening of the vascular system, so which begets more hypertension. So so if you can identify and, can, and get better control of the blood pressure early on, it's going to better protect and lead to, you know, better health of your of your cardiovascular system in general. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, and that pretty much wraps up the Q&A portion. Um, I just wanted to one last time thank everyone for coming to the uh, presentation hosted by the Canbar Cardiac Care Center. Um, and thank you to Dr. Romick for taking the time out of your busy schedule to present on such a prevalent issue. Thank you all again and have a great evening. Thank you.